Did anyone ever tell you that you had the power to change the world when you were young? Think about it for a moment. What did that mean to you? Did it mean you would be a superhero who would fly and save people from villains? Or did it mean you would be a firefighter working all hours of the day and night to prevent tragic events and disasters? Maybe you were going to be a scientist or an astronaut and change the world through discovery. We all thought about how we'd change the world when we were young. But now that we're older, changing the world may mean something completely different than it did when we were kids. Still, one thing's certain. We all have the power to change the world, even if we're not wearing capes, fighting fires, or exploring space. No matter how old we are or where we live, we have the power to change our communities by keeping them free from violence so that our children can grow up in safe and healthy environments. This training will take you on a journey through all the places where you have the power to impart positive change and prevent violence from happening. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. The truth is that violence, in all of its forms, is far too common. In our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our communities. Violence is more than just the physical injuries we see on the outside. It affects us on the inside, too with emotional and psychological scars that can last a lifetime. Violence is also a costly problem and places a terrible burden on our society. Combined, all of these factors make up what we call the burden of violence. Burden can be defined by mortality or morbidity, looking at the incidence and prevalence of disease. And economic burden is another component of measuring burden. Mortality means death. We measure mortality attributable to violence by counting the number of homicides and suicides resulting from violent actions. Morbidity in this context refers to injuries and disease associated with violence. These injuries and diseases can have both short-term and long-term consequences that affect a person's health. And, as we just mentioned, violence also takes a tremendous toll on the economy, known as economic burden. Economic burden is measured through direct and indirect costs, like expenses associated with medical and mental health care, absenteeism, and lost productivity. The breakdown of community infrastructure, decline in property values, and disruption of social services are other examples of the economic burden associated with violence. When you break that arm because of the violent act, you may have to stay home from work for a week. And when you stay home from work for a week, it impacts your employer in an indirect way. Um, it may impact your pay. It, you know, if it's a child that's been, um, that's a victim of violence, the, the child may lose um, education for that time where they're not at school. And so we consider those the economic costs and is a, a much broader um, and more significant impact on violence. The failure to address uh, violence when it occurs, it leads to uh, economic disinvestment, uh, deterioration of neighborhoods, uh, and, and many other effects like that. Even if you aren't a victim of violence, it affects the quality of life in your neighborhood. One thing we're finding, for example, is that people live in neighborhoods uh, at high rates of violence aren't as likely to go out and exercise aren't as willing to go out into their neighborhood and enjoy the parks and the, and, the, and the other facilities that may be around them. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also referred to as CDC, has been working to prevent violence since the late 1970s. CDC officially established the Division of Violence Prevention within the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control in 1993. We have a vision at CDC of creating a society where people live a better quality of life, live a healthier life, because violence is not a part of their life. One of the things we CDC found when it first got involved in the field of violence prevention was that nobody was focused on trying to prevent violence before it occurs. We used to look at violence uh, solely as a crime or medical issue. Our major task at that time in our history was to convince people that violence was indeed a health problem. That was 25, 30 years ago, that's changed. By looking at violence through a public health lens rather than a criminal justice one, we are able to take a universal approach toward identifying risk and protective factors and implementing preventive measures. Ultimately, 
We don't only want to bring perpetrators to justice. We want to prevent violence from happening in the first place. We'll explore this concept further a little later. And what public health brings is a really a new way of looking at it. How can we prevent these events from occurring in the first place? So we don't have to spend all that money, time, and effort in reacting to the problem after it occurs. At CDC, we're focused on the, the primary prevention of violence, which is preventing violence before it happens. And that's our role. That's our primary uh, focus and niche. And it's a very important one and a gap that we're filling. We're in this because we want to create better quality of life for people in this country and around the world. We study um, the range of different types of violence, from child maltreatment, youth violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, as well as suicidal behavior. Exposure to violence, particularly types of violence such as child maltreatment and intimate partner violence, are risk factors for depression, for um, anxiety disorders, for uh, smoking, for drug substance abuse. Um, for obesity, all things that contribute in turn to some of the leading causes of death for all Americans, such as heart disease and cancer. 